Um, I'm Lisa Wood. My uh, company is called Sprout New Media. I'm located in Stowe, Vermont. Um, this is my first WordCamp. I've wanted to come for a long time and just really excited to be here. Um, I applaud you all for making it to the bitter end and being here for the last session. Um, and I hope to make it um, entertaining for you. <laughs> um, quick show of hands. Um, designers in the room? Developers. Users? Sweet. Nice mix. Okay. Um, my objective today is really to give you some of the best practices for um, creating just a, a nice visual design. Very basic. We've done a lot of code stuff. Our, I know my head is hurting from all of the, the code and um, all of the technologies that we've been talking about this weekend. So this is going to be lighter. Um, I'm also going to preface this with, I don't usually work off of a PowerPoint. I'm usually much more free-flowing, so um, this is the way I would normally go through a session like this um, without the graphics set in place ahead of time, so um, take that for what it's worth. That's what's going to happen. Okay. So, design, really, is what we have in our minds, and we bring it out into a way pretty simple. Everything around us is designed. That room upstairs <coughs> on the 11th floor, wow, gorgeous design. Um, if you really take a look around you, this building in particular, every single thing in here has a very conscious design behind it. So what this is about is designing on the web. We're going to tell a story, always, with whatever we put out there. It's not always a story we want to tell, right? So um, my goal here is to show you how not to have your site look like this. Um, or this one. Not quite as bad, but, but still. Pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Not sure what they were thinking. This one actually has a slider, so it's, it's not that updated. Um, but it's, it's interesting. And yes, this is the entire page. <laughs> Um, this one I just had to show you live because this is a hoop. Um, very interesting content. Crazy. <laughs> I don't know, maybe this was a class, maybe this is an ongoing thing. You've seen this before. You were about this. Um, but visually, it, it's really confusing. Um, Wow. Not the way we want to design our sites. It's the main guy uh, coming back. I don't know. They, I think they updated this last in fall 2008. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna move on. No, we're not. There we go. Okay. So we're gonna make sure help you make sure your design so don't suck so that we're not hiding. Them. First things with any project, design development, what have you, any project, we need to ask the right questions, right? We need to find out who's the client, first of all, who's their customer, what's the purpose of the website? Is it informational, like a brochure? Is it an e-commerce site? Is it supposed to sell things? Is it supposed to give directions? What's it supposed to do? There's so many possibilities. So we have to be really clear before we get started. And then what do we need it to do? What kind of functionality does this website have to have? All of those things go into the design. What's the customer's pain? Is this um, a site for, um, for like an ADD client who can't deal with a lot of visuals and needs to be very simple and clear? Or is this for a store? where we need to have lots of um, products with clear information and a lot of different categories and things like that. What do we need to do? What's the customer's pain? What are they looking for? Is there existing branding that we need to work into our design? So the customer might have, and I see this a lot, they might have um, a logo that's, you know, 10 years old and could use some refreshing, but they, they used it on everything. They really want to stay with it. So how can we use their existing branding and still make something that's attractive even if the logo isn't. And I'm going to start with color. Um, I'm a visual person. I love Pinterest. Um, 
it's great for inspiration. And colors make a huge difference in the look and feel of the website and the mood that it creates. So we've got the color wheel here. And raise your hand if you're familiar with the color wheel. Awesome. Um, if you're not, just take a look at this. We've got cool colors and our reds. We've got warm colors um, and our blues are cools. And then over here, we've got the way the color wheel is broken up. We've got primary colors, which are red, blue, and yellow. And secondaries, which are shades of those. That I'm not getting into right now. Complementary colors on the opposite side of the wheel. And then you've got colors that are complementary that are next to each other on the wheel. Now, there's a lot of psychology that goes into choosing colors for your website. Um, blues tend to be kind of corporate business. Um, reds are obviously more fire, fiery driven sites. Um, green, a lot of times you'll use uh, green for like a buy button because you want somebody to go instead of stop. So sometimes red for a buy button isn't a great choice. So there's some information there and there's a ton of information on the web on the psychology of color that you can, you can look up if you choose to. Taste the rainbow. It's not what we're about. Not for this. We want to keep it simple. We want to keep it simple. Um, best practice for your colors in any design, but particularly your website. Um, one or two main colors that complement each other, and an accent color, which is also called um, a conversion color. So, for example, we've got two shades of one color, which is fine. You can use multiple shades. And then we've got a, a second color here and our accent color. And that usually means that we're going to use that color for when we want people to do something. So here's some examples of our two main colors. We need three different color schemes. Two, three, two, three, two. And then the accent color. And so this is just a quick example. There's a million different combinations, obviously. Um, for this particular site, we might have the background be um, the yellow, or a toned down version of that yellow, and then some blue, and then the accent color might be the buy buttons for the links. So that's what that conversion color is for. It's what do we want to use that for when we want people to do something next? Okay? Any questions so far? Feel free to raise your hand if you do. Um, for choosing color schemes, I often use a photo. I just, I really like to take a photo from nature, for example, because in nature all the colors go together. They just do. I don't know how, but they just do. So you take a photo and you might pick out some colors out of that, which is kind of cool. Um, this is a tool that's available online through Adobe. It's called Cooler. And you can actually use this to make a color scheme. Yeah. We spend a lot of time playing around with this. <laughs> so here's the green, and it tells you some complementary colors. The blue, maybe that purple is an accent. So there's a, a neat tool for you. And I'll have the slides up on Slide Deck um, after the session. Another tool is Color Lovers. This site is kind of cool because it's all user-generated color palettes and patterns even. You can get patterns from here too. So if you're on the if you go to browse and you can go to palettes, and you can actually see some color schemes that people have submitted. And granted, they're using more than the cup, just the basic two colors, but um, you can really get some good inspiration. And if you like some of these, you can actually use them. And there's patterns as well. You can also make your own color schemes on the site. So this, this is something to be, those aren't the coolest patterns, but you see what I mean. <coughs> okay. Question on color. Yes. I've actually, um, a cooler is a great tip that looks really cool. Um, I found a really helpful trick. Um, it's called Instant Eyedropper, and I found that it's like a little, have you heard of this? I see that look on your face. You can literally pick out a color from a picture. Because I had, I had a client 
who was like, um, I have this pen and I really love the color of my pen. <laughs> How do I get that color? I'm like, well, send me a picture of it. And you can literally get the HTML code for any pixel in a, in a photo. And I found that really, really helpful. You can. It's, um, it's very cool. When we go back to the web, I'll give you an example of that. Um, one thing with the pictures, I, I use a similar tool. I don't know if it's the same tool or not, but um, I'll often post color schemes out of a photo on my website. So if you're ever looking for some inspiration for color, go to scrogmedia.com and you'll see it every now and then. Um, okay, typography. Exactly, this, this is just a definition off of Wikipedia. The art and technique of arranging type in order to make language visible. Pretty simple, right? Well, when you get into it, it's not quite so simple because we have so many choices. We have our serif that has the little the little feet, um, the sans serif, we've got wide fonts, light fonts, narrow, display fonts, we've got I mean, crazy, now we have wingding fonts and um, fonts that have all capitals, tons and tons of handwritten fonts. Um, and when you're choosing fonts, there's some guidelines. And again, I'm definitely in the camp of keeping it simple. Clear and easy to read. Some fonts are easier to read than others. There's just no doubt about it, especially in your body copy, body text. Um, like Helvetica is easy to read. Um, George is easy to read. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, but one thing that's really important to point out is that we're not we are not limited to what we call um, web safe fonts anymore, which were like basically our computer system fonts. And maybe we had 10 or so. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute how we can use more. But we are unlimited, and we are only limited by um, the licensing for the font. So again, I'll show you that in a minute. But clear and easy to read. Just like color, we're going to use one font website project. Any more than that, and we get this. When you use too many fonts, they all fight for your attention. It's too complicated. Our brain can't easily comprehend. And so people are just going to check out. Opposites attract. Um, a fat font with a skinny font, serif with a sans serif, it's things like that. Um, try to make them different <coughs> from each other. Line height, we'll show you in a second. Line height is really important. Um, you may have heard about that yesterday in one of the sessions. And again, unlimited choices for web. So here's two paragraphs. Um, which one do you think is more readable? Over oh, the green check. Over the green check, right? That was that's really easy for you to sign it in. So lines are spaced a little bit further apart than that. This is a little harder on the eyes to focus on. And the longer your line, the longer your content area, the larger the spacing should be. And again, you can take that too far and just go have the opposite effect. Yes? Are there any, are there any uh, main rules in design about left justification versus full justification on the web? It really depends on the flow of the page. I, um, you your face is working? I like left justified. But, you know, I, I don't do the, what is it, justified on both. Um, that is really hard to read because then you have crazy spacing, font spacing on a line. Um, and again, it, it really depends on the project. As a general rule, I go left justified. I don't do a lot of center. Um, I just don't. It's not my style. Some people do. Every designer has their own style. Right justification, not so much unless you're arranging something on a page and it makes sense. Um, once you do this for a while, you have a sense of what, what looks right and what doesn't. So you really, it's all about practice. That's line height. H1s, H2s, H3s, it's code. Oh. Um, but it's hierarchy. It's page hierarchy. So our H1 is typically our, our page title, headline, right? And hierarchy gives the page structure. So it tells the reader these are the things that are the most important. And unless they've changed SEO again, there is still some SEO benefit to hierarchy. H2, typically from a design perspective, H1 is the biggest, H2 is a little bit smaller, H3 is smaller still, and oftentimes I'll have that in a completely different font. So that would be my second font, or a different color. So maybe it's the same font, different color. 
Um, the font in your logo doesn't count. Um, the font in your body text does. And then bolding, like you could have a H4, H5, A6, H6. It doesn't, I don't get into that. It's like one, two, and three. Maybe four is really just bolded text. Um, I don't think you need to get any more complicated than that. <coughs> so a couple of tools that you can use to find web fonts. Really easy. Um, Google is awesome. Their Google fonts, they're all free. You can download them to your computer. You can use um, their give a little snippet of code to embed them on your website. So if you say, I want to find, let's find a display or a handwriting font, and it should refresh. It usually did it? Oh, okay, it did. So fast, I didn't see it. Okay, so if we want, if we wanted to use this one, we're making a fun Halloween page, and we wanted to use that, then we would go down here to our collection. Um, we can review it, or we can just go right ahead and use it. And then it tells us the code that we need to add to our <coughs> website. And it gives us a couple of different ways to do that. So we can import it from the Google API. We can use some JavaScript if we want to. And then it gives us a CSS to put it to our CSS file. Really easy. And they're constantly adding fonts. <coughs> some of them are better than others. I mean, some of them are absolutely gorgeous, and others I wouldn't touch with a 10 feet pole. But um, for the most part, I mean, there's a lot to choose from there. And then another tool that gives you just as many choices in a different way as Font Squirrel. Um, these are all free for commercial use. Great, great, great free font um, resource. You can download them. You can, if you have a font on your computer and you want to use it, they have a web font generator. And as long as your license allows it, like Adobe fonts, you can't upload. Um, but as long as your Fonts license allows it. You just <coughs> click that, um, and there's an add fonts button. And you find the font file, and you upload it, and it will create um, a kit for you, a web font kit. <coughs> you then take the CSS and the code, and you put it on your site. Does it generate for the <coughs> for I know that Does it generate it for what? Uh, Yeah, um, it does work on Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is always going to have some things that it doesn't like. I use this all the time on client websites, and I've never had a problem with it. So we basically need, we basically need three different kind of font extensions. It gives you all of them. In your kit, it gives you all of the formats that you're going to need. Yeah, really great resource. Yeah, I use Font Squirrel a lot. And so you can, you know, if you want to just look around and find some, um, there's tons. And you can filter, um, and then you can download onto your own computer, like I said, and then up, upload to the web. And then this one I just found yesterday, actually. It's kind of cool. There's some sites out there that will automatically pair fonts for you. And this one gives you some, <coughs> some choices. So they're kind of already done the work. Just play around and look at all the different resources out there. And um, I will ask you, I will ask everybody, please choose responsibly. We are a Fortune 500 <laughs> company, not a lemonade stand. Please don't use comic books. <laughs> um, it's got a bad rap. If you're making a comic book, it's definitely the one to use. Um, or a child's poster for your kids' preschool. But other than that, not really what we use for um, <coughs> professional projects. Questions on fonts? Yes. This is maybe a personal preference thing. Um, and I, uh, oh, sorry, do you want to use that? Yes. <laughs> uh, quick question about um, upper or lowercase. Mm -hmm. I, uppercase seems to be really popular and really eye-catching these days. 
personally, I think it feels like yelling and shouting and angry and aggressive. How do you feel? Depends on the font. Depends on the project. Um, on my website, I use primarily a lowercase. Um, I don't Thank even you. use sentence case on my own site. Um, I think that in a in a headline or you know something like that that you want to call attention to, all caps is fine. But absolutely, it can be overused, and it is it can definitely be perceived as shouting. Great point. Grids and layout. Um, with responsive design, this has really kind of gone out the window, but I want to show you the basics on grids. Um, we want things to be lined up well so that they're visually pleasing. And we have, what, three seconds, maybe five, when someone gets to our website, and they're going to decide if they like it, they want to stay and stick around for a while, or they're just going to take off. So, yes, the code's important. Yes, everything else that we learned about this weekend is important. It still has to look good. So a grid, you'll see, this page, these are three columns. I didn't do the whole grid, but everything is really lined up, right? This is just a poster. This isn't a website. But this is a website, and it's very, um, it's built on a grid. We've got the four sections here. These two rows really um, for the rest of the upper part of the site, so they work in a grid even though everything doesn't have to line up exactly to the edges. But it's, um, you don't have things all willy-nilly on the page. Now, this site you might think, oh, well there's, it does look like things are kind of arranged erratically, right? And then lower down the page, so it really is built on a grid. And this is a uh, Charity Water is a really great example of a well-built or well-designed website. And again, they have grid. Lower down the page, still have that grid. And they have, they've broken it down even further. So this section takes up three of the columns, and this one has a five. Questions on grids? I'm moving too quickly, and I wanted to make this lightweight for you and um, less code heavy, but please stop if you need me to. Red space and padding. Let's not crowd everything, right? We, we all need some breathing room. Um, minimalistic design. Designer knows he's achieved perfection, not only when there's nothing left to add, but you can't take anything else out. You can't take anything else out without degrading the design, and then you hit it. Things breathe. It's a really cramped. A little smaller line height. So this is a photo, and just there's not a lot of space there. This just feels better. Okay. <coughs> yes. Are you awake? Can you do some jumping jacks? Good. So that's. Eh. Um, this is a nice example of a site. This is, this is local. This is the Boston Salon um, that I found when I was. Googling. And they've got, you know, they've got a nice layout there, they've got the grid work in, a lot of white space, a lot of breathing room. Elegant, simple. And this is another one. I actually want to show you this one live because it's really cool. Uh, there's very little on this page, right? They've got two colors, black and blue. Blue is, is their um, conversion color, and white is their background. And when you click on it, Here's where you come, and as you scroll down the page, again, there's a couple of columns, lots of white space, very simple, very clear, um, not a lot to it, but this is a very well designed website, and just because it doesn't have a lot on it doesn't mean it didn't take a lot of time to do it. Yeah. go through the non-designers web book by Robert Williams at any point? No. Oh, when I was taking Greenleaf, that was like the first primer for us. Oh yeah? 
No, I've never heard of that book. The non-design is web book. Non-design is web book. It's a quick read. It's got a lot of guarantees. Not as deep as you. So I'll, I'll check that out. Who's the author again? Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Not the, not a yak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Designer. I'll check that out. Okay. Uh, moving on to images. We need photos. We can have the best colors, the best typography. We still need some photos. It's not just what it looks like, it's how it feels. All of what we've been talking about goes along with how the visitor feels when they hit our website. This is a page. Make sure you give credit to the photographer. I'll give you some resources in a minute on where you can find good photos. Um, don't just grab photos off the web. Don't Google something, grab a photo, and use it. Even, even with giving credit to the site, um, if you're using something for commercial use, you have to have the proper licensing rights. There's just no two ways about it. Okay. Um, use images that are relevant. We're not going to put Iron Man on our ADHD side, are we? Um, use images that reflect, reflect the mood. <coughs> so a yoga site might have some stones, might have some lavender. Um, they're not, again, going to have Iron Man. Quality counts. If you have a great camera and you can take some well-lit, professional-looking photos, there's some great cameras out there that can lot. Um, but make sure that, you know, if you have, if you're making a hotel site, if those guest rooms have the proper lighting, have the proper staging, that they look professionally done. Because it's going to reflect on what your customers think. I've worked with a, a fair amount of clients that take their own pictures and they, they give me like hundreds of pictures and I just, I can't use any of them. And I have to have a really hard conversation with them that says, you know what, you really need to invest a little bit of money and get a professional to do this for you. It makes a huge difference. Um, web resolution, you probably all know 72 DPI and use optimization tools, whether you use Photoshop um, or use an online tool or something like that, um, just so that you're not using 300 DPI images on the web that will slow down your site, because we know how important speed is. JPEG and PNG formats are best. I use PNGs when I have, um, when I need a transparent background. Otherwise, I use a JPEG most of the time because the files are smaller. Um, sight lines is something, I don't really have a, a visual for you, but um, think of, you know, you have an image of um, a businesswoman, right? And she's looking, and you have a buy button here. And she's looking over here. Or she's faced like this with her hands crossed. You see so many photos now. Um, <laughs> kind of over that, but. And she's looking that way. But if, if you flip that photo, and she was looking down towards your buy button, or up towards your e-newsletter sign-up box, right? Your, your eyes are going to follow where she's looking naturally. So pay attention to how um, the photos you choose are working <coughs> with your content. Great place to find images. Ever heard of Comp Fight? Anybody? Yes. Um, Comp Fight pulls its database from um, from Flickr. Really cool. Um, let's just search for, uh, I don't know, search for laughter. <coughs> if our internet will work with us, there we go. Okay. So all of these images above this line are stock photos that you can buy. Everything below that line is from Flickr. So you can click on a photo, and if you hover over it, it tells you the dimensions that it's available in. You can even say, I don't really want that one, so I'm going to X that out. Usually works, but um, we'll use this one as an example. Usually you can X them out and they just disappear. Um, but this photo, it tells you what sizes you can download it. 
And then it, it allows you to download it, but also gives you this code to copy and paste so that you give a photo credit to that photographer. Really, really important. And before you choose a photo, over here, you can choose your Creative Commons license. So you can select, I only want images that I am licensed to use commercially. So you don't have to worry about everything else out there. Everything below this line, you are able to use if you embed that code. Yes? There's a WordPress plugin for that. There is a WordPress plugin. Yep. Yep. I tend to not use the plugins, but yes, there is. What's it called? I think it's just Comfy. I think it's Comfy. Yeah. 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 Really good resource. Yes? Uh, Creative Commons has its own search tool as well. That'll search Google, uh, you know, all, all the different Everything? image places. Yeah. Oh, cool. If you go to their website. Yeah. Okay. I'll check that out. Um, if you choose to go the paid route, I use iStock Photo when I need stock photography. It's, um, I find it's the, the most reasonably priced with the best selection, you know, without getting super, super expensive. Um, they, they, their pricing has definitely increased in the past six months to a year, but it's still fairly reasonable. So I stock photos is a good resource. And this is really, you know, our design has to relate to our audience, and our customer's audience. If it doesn't, then it's not any good. Yes. Before I forget, I'm going to add something to the image. Because I'm the designer and I work, I work with the developer. And what I noticed is that, you know, they, even, they use the 75 DPI most of the time, but the images are not cropped. So mm, sometimes yes. the images are huge and they just shrink it down to the size what the, what the website is doing. Mm -hmm. But it's still a huge amount of data. Absolutely. So if you embed something, then you know you should choose the correct uh, image size. That's yes. one thing. And the other thing is that don't just pull the image. So <laughs> you know you have a 400 400 pixel so, uh, pixel uh, uh, column, and you find a smaller image or a bigger image, and you just pull it over. You know. Just to make it and it completely distorts the image. So you're talking about resizing exactly. without keeping yes. Exactly. That's two problems that I noticed that developers do. And they just don't see that, you know, the face is much wider or much uh, Yeah, and you know, we we really have to give <coughs> developers credit. I mean there is no way that I mean I do both, but I don't do the development nearly to the degree that I do not the design. And and there's a reason for that. For a long time, when I first started my business, I did both. And I found that um, my, my designs were limited. Because as I was designing something, I was thinking, okay, well, I want to do this, but how am I going to make that work? Right? So I wasn't able to really be an expert at everything. So I said, this is where I want to focus most of my energy. And I'm going to hire somebody to do the heavy lifting of the dev stuff for me. And so that's how I, I work. And, and again, this talk was initially thought, I thought, well, I work with so many customers who come to me and say, I have an awesome developer. I love my developer, but he tells me he doesn't know how to design anything, hmm. right? So they come to me to help guide him so that they can make, they can make it work. Very good points. Make sure that if you're resizing, that you're keeping the aspect ratio in place, yeah. Yes? Yeah, what are your information? There is a program called JPEG Mini. Oh, what? JPEG Mini. JPEG Mini. Yes. And it uh, resizes the uh, JPEG to real animation and you know, like, uh, much smaller size. It's fantastic. There's a lot of tools. That's, not, that's one I hadn't heard of, but thank you. JPEG Mini. <coughs> Other questions? <coughs> Okay, so I've just given you all these guidelines, right? This is what we want to do. Art is about breaking the rules. So take the guidelines, practice, get comfortable, but know that you don't have to do everything by the book because that's what art is. 
We want to be able to express ourselves. We want to be able to provide our clients with something that's valuable and is going to work for their customers. Um, but we want to be creative at the same time. So don't pigeonhole yourself and just into rules. Um, you can bend them a little bit and still have things look nice. Questions? Anything I didn't cover? Yes. Um, do you have any suggested tools for the grid lines? How to make sure that the website lines up? I did say I was going to show you. Um, yeah, you can. In, do you use what do you use for Visual Editor? I don't. Okay. I, mean, I might use Photoshop. But. Photoshop. Um, you can. There's a, a setting at the top, like the view settings. You can show the grid. Okay. And then you can adjust the grid to how many pixels you want that to be. Okay. Yes. Any recommendations for Visual Editor? I'm sorry. Recommendations for Visual Editor? Um, I <coughs> use Photoshop the most. Um, I think iPicky is one that's on the web. I, I believe that's still free. Splash, splash up. Splash up. Yeah. Not as up. powerful as Photoshop, but it's free. It's there. Well, you know, um, sometimes I'll be like, I really don't want to fire up Photoshop right now because it just, you know, it's heavy. But. Um, <coughs> Flash up. Jump right in. Cool. Um, if you're on a Mac, Preview is a great tool. You can resize images right in Preview. You can't, yeah, you can change the resolution, you can change the dimensions, um, you can't like add, you can't change like the framing and such. But for quick resizing, Preview is great on a Mac. I think you can do the same thing in Paint on Windows, but it's been a while since I've been on a Windows machine, so I'm not sure. Um, we were talking about the color dropper. I use this little thing in Fireshop, or something, Firefox, um, where I can click on it and it gives me this little crosshair and I can drag it around and I can choose all kinds of colors. So then I click on a color that I want. It will automatically copy that to my clipboard um, or I can click this little drop down and I can copy all the any different value that I need, RGB or um, and if it isn't quite right, I can click on that, and I can just drag this around until it's perfect. And again, I've got my values all right here. So that's a Firefox add-on. What's Col your name? And it's Col they make it for Chrome. Yep. Yes. Colorzilla. Yes. <coughs> One of the great things in WordPress is that the themes do so much the layout for us that we can populate it with content. But one of the challenges that I face at least is how to come up with a good header image. Can you give us any wisdom just to point us in the right direction for headers? Yeah, I mean, using these practices that we just talked about, I mean, again, depending on the project, um, a nice logo, um, logo type made out of type is nice if your customer doesn't have one. I don't use a lot of um, like photos and such in a header, but it, it depends on, again, what the project is. Um, make sure it's balanced. Colors are, are going to match. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It helps. I need those. Okay, and, and definitely, um, again, it, depending on the site, you might want something that's really bold and stands out with you know big font and without being over the top, and then maybe it's you know, for a, um, like a very basic site, sometimes the header is the main graphic on the entire page, and then you just have some fonts um, that you do a font replacement, and that's enough for the design. It really depends. Good question. Anybody else? Yeah, where can I find the slides? Um, I'm going to post them, um, and I'll put a link out on Twitter. I have a, a fairly long drive home tonight, so when I get home, I'll post them. So you can see them by the morning. Maybe one additional question about uh, design. How do you embed or how do you take into account the research about eye movement as the page? Yeah, um, you, were you in the SEO session today? Uh, no, it was mentioned yesterday. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, crazy Eye? is a great tool if you don't use that already. Um, and it will actually give you, it'll give you a, um, a visual of where people are looking. 
So it'll actually give you like different colors on their page, like you can put a, um, a website up, and it will tell you what people are looking at by where their mouse is and what they're clicking on, and you can use that in your design. I mean, you can use that as research, or if you have a page that's already there, uh, as a way to maybe make some edits. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm just wondering if uh, there's anything you can say about um, how much your your information should be broken up into different sections or pages, or whether you should have one long page, or if there's anything that you use as a rule of thumb. Yeah, it used to be that um, above the fold was, you know, we had to have everything above the fold, and we had lots and lots of pages so that things didn't fall below the fold. That's not really the case anymore, especially with mobile. I mean, people are, they expect to scroll. That said, um, ridiculously long pages you could certainly break up. I, I tend to say, you know, four or five and three posts, three blog posts is about the limit for scroll break it off to the next one. Um, without yeah, I, I allow for scrolling and I, I don't design against that, but you know, use your judgment. You don't want to lose the user, but um, I think if they can get to the information that they need with the least amount of clicks is really important. Yes. This is a maybe a last question. Um, do you think that home page design and what they put on the home page is changed over the period of time? Because what I see, what I am, my feeling is that you know we used to start let's say seven years ago. Plan on this and this company's home page, and we have some intro. But what I do lately is more like put a lot of content and a lot of information. So people, so I don't bother people with welcoming our page because we know that we are, that they know we are on this page. Right, right. But we need, you know, visual information as much as possible. They, that's a great question. And um, and they, they do need information. Uh, you know, don't put welcome right now. Um, again, it's an old, the thing we used to do, we don't, they, they know where they are, right? That said, I don't put a ton of information, I don't recommend putting a ton of information on the homepage. What I do recommend is that you're very clear what you want the customer to do next. So your call to action needs to be really clear on your homepage. So maybe it's sign up for the newsletter. So you make that button really big and that's what they're going to do. Maybe they, it's a link to hire you. Maybe it's a link to go buy something. Um, Pick one thing, maybe two, that is really important and design around that. Most people aren't going to come into your website and land on your homepage if they're coming from somewhere else. Okay? Um, so the other pages are really one where you want to expand your content, and your homepage is, is like an introduction. It's a combination of an introduction and a soft sell. Here you are. What, here's what I want you to do next. That's, that's the way I design it. Answer your question? Yeah, I just, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah and again, it's going to depend on the site. It really is. Yeah. I'm wrap it up. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So I've been tasked to doing closing remarks. Um, we want to thank you all for coming. Be sure to thank the sponsors who have left already. But <laughs> you, you can look, find them online. Um, if you guys are local, be sure to check out the Boston WordPress Meetup. We meet here once a month. Um, I can't remember those anymore. Meetup.boston.org. Um, and we should have videos up in, I'd say about, give it a month or two, maybe even three. Well, this question will be on video, all the presentations? The presentation's only for Saturday and Sunday. With the exception of one or two, because someone designed their slides for me. There's one. There's only one. Oh, there's one. Okay. And if you didn't pick up your shirt, visit the uh, registration desk. Thanks, guys.